So the way, the kind of classic Unix way to do this is to break the task down into two pieces. You have a lexer, which takes a string of bytes and assembles them into kind of meaningful semantic units. So the lexer would take you know, 1.5 and say, this is a number. Or it would take dog and say, this is a word or an identifier. And then that information, which is called, those are, are tokens. So select so tokenizes the input. That gets passed to yak, which Shai mentioned the other day, which is yet another compiler compiler, which knows how to basically implement a, a context-free grammar. It's not quite that strong. It's, it's kind of the useful parts of implementing a context-free grammar. And so it's able to take input that looks like um, number plus sign number and say, this is an expression. This is a mathematical expression. And additionally, both of them, what they can do beyond kind of the basic functionality that you've seen in finite state machines and the grammars that you've been looking at, they don't just recognize stuff. At every step, whenever you see something that looks like a number, then you can give it some action and say to the lexer, when you see you know, a 1, a period, and a 5, go ahead and figure out what the real decimal value of that is and remember that. And likewise, on the yak side, when you see a number plus a number, then you can tell it, you know, add these things. So that's the, the basis. And here we're just going to go through. It's a really short example. And uh, just to give you an idea of like kind of mechanically, how does this work? So first, let's look at the lexer. Unfortunately. Both of these tools were originally written for C, and I didn't find a, a nice, easy-to-use version for Java or some other nice language. So you'll just have to kind of gloss over the parts that are C that you don't understand, although I think that it's sufficiently similar to Java that um, it won't be too hard to see what's going on. You can just say what they mean. There aren't, there isn't some C. Right. I mean, the, the whole thing is like 40 lines long. Yeah. So at the top, just kind of taking care of um, getting some header files. This is equivalent to saying import, you know, import java.util or whatever. And now we just jump straight into defining what these tokens look like. So we're trying to tell, actually I guess I should say what we're trying to build here. We want a calculator. We want something that we can put in you know, just a regular expression that you would you know, type into your little graphing calculator and it's going to compute the result. Right? So I mean, this, this doesn't seem so hard, but there are some tricky things, like making sure that you get something like 2 plus 4 times 5. You, know, you have to do the times before you do the plus. And so what we're going to get out of this is a very intuitive and easy way to, uh, to write that down without having to really think about what's going on. Does it take parentheses? And we'll also. Uh, Tell it how parentheses uh, change the order of evaluation. That, actually, somebody asked this exact question about when you're implementing in the context of grammar, how do you make the semantic stuff go the way you want to go and make the grammar unambiguous in that way? So it'll answer that question. Sure. I guess. The job of the lecture is, uh, well, it's much less interesting than the job of the, the parser, which is the yak side. Here we're just trying to assemble a string of characters into the meaningful chunks, into um, numbers up to the top. And then we just want to recognize kind of basic arithmetic symbols down here. So here, this is, uh, I mean, this is syntax that you probably recognize either from you know, writing regular expressions in last month or uh, writing regular expression this month. <laughs> Does anyone want to hazard a guess what these three lines mean? The Come plus on. Is here, yeah, the plus is the meaning of the plus from last month. One, 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 one or more. more. Yeah. One or more zeros to nines, or one or more zeros to nines, point, one or more zeros to nines, or about. 
an arbitrary zero 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 or nothing in front. Well, so well, actually, the, the plus this month, if you put it up in the exponent, it means the same as the plus last month. Okay. okay. When people write zero plus, like where the star mm -hmm. usually goes, they don't mean union. They mean zero, zero star. So you do see pluses also that way, too. But here the star after this decimal point, zero, nine, star, then the second one. That means zero or more, yeah. And things that are in double quotes, that's just literal. Yeah. So these three, these three expressions, which are joined by a, a bar, which just means you know any of these, it's it's just or. So it just corresponds to three different formats of writing a number. And you know, if, if we were super clever, we could probably condense it down to one monstrous regular expression. But it's not really clear that we gain anything but you know, like ego points if we do it's that. Yeah. So the minus signs would be more now capture that. Right, we're going to implement unary minus as actually uh, an arithmetic operation. Because we want to be able to say something like minus and then some computed value. So the first part of each of these little sections, these little clauses in the Lex file, the first part defines the patterns that we're looking for. And then we just follow that with whatever the action is when we see that pattern. So there's this little finite state machine that's running around sucking in characters from the input file. And whenever it sees that it's finished recognizing some token, you know, so it reads 24.3, you know, and then it sees a plus sign next. And it knows you know, there's 24.3 is a number, but 24.3 plus is not a number. So it needs to do the number thing with 24.3. So this little chunk of code, this one line, says, assigned to this variable yylval, that's this kind of arbitrarily named variable that means the semantic value of the token. So in this case, we're saying the semantic value of any token is its numeric value. And we assign to that just the conversion from ASCII to a floating point number of the string that was recognized. And then we, we send back to the parser that what we just saw was a number. The second one is considerably less interesting because we really just want to know, are these, you know, did we recognize a character that's valid in an arithmetic ex expression? So we're willing to accept you know, any of these little operators, parentheses, and you get to uh, you know, put new lines in there too. And here, there's no semantic value of a plus. You know, there's not any sense in which a plus has the value 3 or anything. So we don't worry about signing it a value. And there's a little shortcut here. We don't even say, oh, I'm returning an operator. I just return the character itself. And you know, the token plus is represented by the character plus itself. And the star in front of YY text? That's. Uh, so that's a C-ism. Okay. Right, I mean, it's because YY text is a string that represents the entire chunk of text that we just recognized. You know, so up here, when we recognize the number, YY text was the string of characters you know, 2, 4, point 3. Here, we know that we just saw a single character. And it turns out that with pointers in C, if you want the first character of a string, then you just get to say star and the pointer that goes to the string. It's not worth it to, to worry about why if, it's, if it doesn't come to you. And we have one, uh, one last kind of catch-all rule. Dot means uh, any character. So dot is um, basically the one-character wildcard. And if somebody types in something that's not a number and it's not a symbol, then we don't try to do anything intelligent. We just say, I don't know what you're talking about, and move on. 
So that really takes care of uh, you know, the mechanical part or the, the interesting part of this file. Then here is just defining this procedure. You know, what do you do when there's an error? Well, I just print out some error message and keep going. And the entire program is just going to call this yyparse function, which is actually a function that comes from the X side. This just happens to be a good place to put the, the main part of the program. Does anyone have questions about the Lex stuff? Do you see how this could be implemented by a pretty basic finite state machine? I mean, it's similar to you know, when you've been trying to write a finite state machine to accept you know, the string 1101 you know, and recognize when it sees that. All that Lex is doing in the background is looking at these various rules that you've put down, and then it's going to generate some big uh, finite state machine that does the right thing. Where's YY text declared? Is that just built in automatically? Yeah. There are a number of, of variables that just kind of appear automatically, because we're not writing a real C file. We're writing a Lex file that has bits of C kind of inserted in there. And Lex promises to us that you know, whenever I'm inside the rule, inside the action for some match, then it places certain pieces of information from the match into various variables. The, the all uppercase number, is that a? So that's, that's going to come from this, this header file called y.tab. Okay. It'll make more sense in about five seconds. The output? Lex itself doesn't print anything out unless I put a print statement like this unrecognized character line. Lex's job is just to sit there and by default it'll read from standard input. So you, when we run the program, it'll sit there and read input from the keyboard. And then it provides functions that will return whatever the next token and line is. Right, so actually what happens is that Yak asks for a, a token. So once we kind of go through the Yak grammar and then run it, then we can see kind of a better idea of how control is going around. So, I'm sorry, so, so each time this thing's called, it passes back the type of the token, and if you want to know, if you want the type of the token, token you, you've got this X term available to you in whatever you're calling it from. Presumably your lex or something like that. Or your, I'm not really sure. Like, so. Your yak or I don't. I, yeah, yak. yak. Okay. It's kind of, uh, it's a really close relationship between lex and yak. I mean, they were definitely made with each other in mind in the sense that you know, there are a few, uh, just like kind of the conventions make it very seamless for them to operate together. You know, and so. This YY, uh, YYL val and the defining number, where we return number, those are both things that are defined by yak. And then it's, it's visible from lex so that you're able to pass back information. All right. So this is going to take care of tokenizing all of the input. But now we just have some string of you know, number times paren number minus ya ya. And so we need some way, not that. We need some way to interpret you know, what, does, uh, you know, what does some mathematical expression mean and what exactly is a valid mathematical expression. And so. Again, we have some uh, just kind of header junk setting up basic, basic information. This uh, include is it's another thing like saying um, you know import java.math you know, because we want to use uh, the exponentiation function. This is where a number comes from. You know, when we say percent token, that's just saying that you know, one of the kinds of tokens that's going to come back from Lex is this thing called a number. 
And they have to know, you know, they both have to know what number is so that when Lex says, oh, this is a number, that, you know, Yak knows what it's talking about. So now we get to the interesting part. So, so here's the grammar itself. Um, it's very similar to, I guess, BNF, uh, Bacchus Nar form. Have, has anyone, does that mean anything to anyone? <laughs> it's, um, I don't know, maybe, well. Like yeah. so right. It's not any more powerful than the other ways you've seen of writing a grammar. The only thing that's nice about it is that it makes intuitive sense when you look at it, and you don't have to, you don't have these kind of uh, auxiliary uh, productions just to make it fit into some syntactic form like CNF. And uh, I mean, just like when you define a regular grammar, you know, we have this, uh, we have S, the beginning production. So basically, I'll just kind of walk through what each of the lines mean, and then if there are any questions, then we can talk about it some more. So we're willing to recognize things that are S followed by a line. And so this is going to give us just this recursive definition that will recognize as many lines as you like. But we don't like a single line by itself. Or a, we don't like empty input. Now, a line. Just want to up the front. Okay. Uh, that's not going to help. This is VNC. Oh, you're going to... Put it on this. Whoa. That's easy. Um. Need a too much, huh? That's good, except you can't find a scroll. This is scroll bar. Who needs scroll bars, right? Okay. Yeah. So. So once we, uh, so now we're talking about a line. What's a line? Well, a line could be an empty line, like just a new line, in which case our action is to quit, the exit, or it could be a sum and then a new line, in which case we print out the value, the semantic value of the sum, and then uh, and move on. We don't quit. And then what's a sum? Well. A sum is a sum plus a term. You know, so we, there's a, a very strict pattern here that we keep having these recursive definitions that allow you to string together a certain number, you know, any number of, uh, of expressions at the same level of precedence. And each one of those expressions then is going to bump down to the next higher level of precedence. Um, so here we, we're saying that pluses and minuses, for one, they get, um, is that right? Yeah. For one, we, we parse them left to right. It's, it's not obvious to see which way it's actually going to be parsing this, but if we were to switch, say, and say a sum could be a term minus a sum, as opposed to a sum minus a term, it would change the order in which we look at the minuses. And so something like 5 minus 4 minus 1 would give the wrong answer. It would give 2 instead of 0. And I don't, know, I don't really know how interesting it is to, to belabor each of these little productions, but the most important thing here is just to see that at each level, we allow some string of these, and then there's this kind of base case where we're, we're willing to say that a term by itself is a sum. And then inside a term, 
we'll look at higher precedence operations. And on up to, um, to exponentiation and unary negation. So, can you explain thing? <laughs> See, I don't know what... I, I couldn't come up with a better name than... A thing is, is a thing that has higher precedence than exponentiation. Because it could be, I mean, what do you call a, a parenthesized expression? Yeah, because certainly that has. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, OK, so I understand that. But you have, um, dollar sign, dollar sign equals. Right, so I haven't explained any of what's going on in the actions. Just like in Lex, after we had some little uh, regular expression that we wanted to match, then we could put some C code over there and braces. It's the same idea here. But now we want to know how to combine the semantic value of each of the, uh, each of the terms in the production. And so what Yak does is it takes this little chunk of C code and it furnishes, with some, furnishes us with some kind of meta variables. So dollar dollar turns out to be the semantic value of the left hand side symbol. And then the, uh, the symbols on the right side are just numbered dollar one, dollar two, dollar three. So what this, this one line right here says is when I see you know, something that, you know, when I see a sum, a plus, and a term, then I can reduce that by saying I get a new sum whose semantic value is the sum, the, the addition of that first thing and the third thing. So whatever the semantic value of the original sum and this term over here, I add them together and that becomes the semantic value of um, the source of the production. And since the only thing that actually has semantic value is a number, it has to drill through the whole thing before it can build it back up and figure this stuff out. Anyway. Yeah. So the numbers are the leads. Right. right. So this is a, a bottom-up parser. So it, it goes all the way down until it sees, you know, this thing is a number, you know, which is a thing, and so I can actually start doing something with it. You know, so saying, you know, number exponent to number, and it can actually, you know, then it's able to reduce that to a single number. And you don't have to say that, no, you don't have to give thing the value of number, that just sort of happens? Right. If I were more considerate to you guys, I would have written it in. But <laughs> by default, if you just have a, a, a unit production like that, then it copies it over. So it's there's kind of this implicit dollar dollar equals dollar one over there. All right, so does anyone have? Numbers only take things; they don't take numbers. Well, a number. A thing can be anything. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, I. Or it has to be in parentheses. No. Or a number. Or a number. I could suit, I could but say. Thing gets, gets parsed as a thing in parentheses. No, it's, no it's or a that or. Oh, either one of right. these. Right, right, right. Got it. I mean, all of these places I could say instead of a factor, you know, I could say a you know, number here. Instead of or in addition? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, in addition to. All right, so I mean, now that we defined all this junk, we should at least you know, take the second to see it work. Um, so um, it's not really so much exciting stuff you can do with arithmetic, but uh, Is it turning that 
the Lex and the Yak into a templated C thing that it's created? Yeah, yeah, we can take a look at that. So, uh, what does it do? Um, I can't see. Hmm. Uh-oh. I think I just put an error into it. Yeah. Putting the number? Right. So, so even though it seems fair to put number in there, it really uh, it's not so good for the parser because now there are two ways to deal with having that number. This is actually a, an unplanned good example. You just made the grammar bigger? Yeah. We should back up. Remember there was a question about this exact grammar. We did E goes to E plus E and E star E and then E goes to numbers and then you said that was ambiguous and then somebody said, well, how do you make it really work when I showed you the two parse trees? How do you make that happen? And I said there's different ways. You can put parentheses in language or you can make it have precedence. So what Rusty's grammar here is just a different grammar that does the same thing but insists on a precedence. Instead of having sum going to sum plus sum, he goes sum goes to sum plus a different non-terminal symbol. And that's what forces you to only have one parse tree for every one of these expressions. Because you have to decide when that something comes, and you don't get to, if you just do 3 plus 4 times 7, there's only one way to do it. The 4 times 7 becomes the term. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the answer to that question that somebody asked about a week ago, or whenever. So do people see why I got shift reduce conflicts mm -hmm. without really knowing what a shift reduce conflict is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should explain it. You should. Okay, so the way that the parser works, the way that, you know, there's some C program that's generated after Yak looks at this file, thinks for a while, and, and kind of hiccups a bunch of C code. It generates a parser which basically, I guess it's essentially a push down machine. It's a, it's a C program that's simulating a push-down machine. Yeah. That's right. So at each step, it, it asks for the next token. So it, it goes over and knocks on Lex's door and says, you know, what's the next token? And Lex spits around in this little finite state machine, sucking in some characters, and says, the next thing's a number. And then Yak looks at a stack of tokens that it's been developing and this next token. And then all of these rules can then be applied in a pretty direct way. You know, if, if Yak sees that you know, the next token, uh, you know, that nothing interesting is on the stack, and the next token is a number, I'll say, fine, I, uh, you know, I'm willing to take that number and put it onto the stack as a thing. Well, then if it gets you know, a thing, and then... Um, or maybe it already had a minus on the stack. Like it saw a minus, it couldn't really do anything with it. So it shifts it. The two operations at any point. It can either take the next token and shift it onto the stack, or it can use whatever's on the stack to, you know, as the right hand side of one of these rules, and put something, you know, take something off the stack and put something smaller back on. So it can take you know, 4 plus 5, if that's sitting on top of the stack, then they'll say, oh, this looks like addition. And yank it off, add the two together, and then put 9 back on the stack. And these rules just uh, give you a very definite way of knowing, you know, when do I shift something and when do I take some set of tokens that are already on the stack and reduce them by some rule. What happens though is if you if you have an ambiguous grammar, like this, well then at some point there are two valid choices. You know, that I could either you know, shift a number, I could either take a number and reduce it to a thing, or I could take a number and I could reduce it to a factor. And it's not obvious to Yak which one to do. So if you create an ambiguous grammar, then it, 
it's very unhappy not knowing what to do. It's willing to make a guess, but it's usually going to be wrong. And so that's why it says things like reduce, reduce conflict. If there are two ways to reduce something. So to get from a number to a value, Right. Right. And the reason that you do that, I mean, it seems like it's a lot of extra work. You know, to, to take a number, say if I just put in 5, then you'd be tempted just to say, you know, I'm willing to accept a number. You know, a number is, is fine, and when someone puts a number in, then they, they just get the number back. But in order to make the precedence work, you know, so that 4 plus 5 times 3 or whatever, parse is right, then you have to force it to go through and bubble up through these various levels of precedence you know, to give, basically give the parser a chance to execute you know, the 5 times 3 before it has the opportunity to say 4 plus 5. No, I think I managed to print out an error-free version. Okay. I'm not making any promises, but... Okay, uh, Rusty, maybe it would help, and maybe people can say whether it would or not, but what if you just wrote uh, 3 plus 4 times 7 on the board and try to parse it and show what's in the stack and what's going on? I can try to do that. <laughs> and then we can imagine that there's a number there and not a number there, and you can show what, where the choice is. All right. So, first, uh, at first, I'm I'm yak. I, I'm gonna have to, like you know switch the yak and the lex hat here. First, I'm yak, and I say you know nothing's going on. I need a token. So so now I'm I'm lex, and I say all right, you know there's a three there, and I keep going because maybe it's thirty five. But then there's a plus. I'm like well, all right, that's not any good. So three, that's your token. And so I send it back as a number. And uh, you know, I, I say this number has the value 3. So Yak sees this. It says, what can I do with the number? Well, there's nothing on the stack. So I can't reduce anything. So I, I put the number onto the stack. Um, where's our stack? I guess our stack is over here. Um, and there's there's some slightly tricky kind of order of operations. Like, are you are you willing to just look at a number and say, oh, it's a thing, and then move on, or not? And I'm pretty sure that what you have to do is actually put it on. You put it on the stack, and then the next step is to see, oh, this just has to be a thing, and then you actually reduce it. So we've got a number on the stack, and now we want another token. We ask. Uh, we ask Lex for another token. It's a plus, which is its own uh, its own sort of token. And so now, you actually see the plus. And there's a number sitting over here, and it knows that there's nothing it can do with number plus, right? We never wrote number plus up there. So what it has to do is rather than shifting the plus. It has to reduce the number. So it's going to take the number, take it off, and say a number is a thing, and then put a thing back on there. So now, how does this? Okay. Backs all the way up until it reaches the sum. Yeah. So now it says, uh, the next token is still a plus, but I can't do plus thing. That's another thing that I've, I've never written. You know, so it takes it off. Oh, I could have left it. And now uh, we go to a factor. We keep going. I mean, again, you can't say plus in a factor, so it turns into a term. What's next? So terms, 
term, we still have to keep going, right? So we pop term, and then we reduce it, and we shift, uh, not shift, but we, we replace it with a sum. So now I have something that's, everything that's higher precedent than a sum has been taken care of, which in this case is nothing. And now I see a plus. And something that looks like sum plus, that's starting to make some sense. It's, you know, we're not, we haven't completed a rule at that point, but Yak at least thinks that, yeah, you know, there's, there's something to that, so why don't we go ahead and put the plus on and see what's going you know, to happen next. Now it's time for another token, because we just used up the plus, and Lex happily gives us a four. Oh, it's, it has to sit over here. It's important to realize that this number four, it doesn't go straight onto the stack. Okay, this is the look ahead token. And you, I don't know if you've heard uh, like, like the LRK, I think Shai mentioned that a few days ago, which basically means that you get K look aheads. Yak only gives you one, which turns out to be sufficient for you know, all the useful stuff. Yeah, because just like when the plus was sitting here, like I couldn't have put the plus on the stack and then reached under it and changed the number into a thing, into a term, into a factor, right. or a factor into a term. So to get this level of expressivity, you do have to have this kind of independent look ahead token. So now I have a number. This doesn't really look like it's going anywhere, so I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to go ahead and shift the number. So that's not really so good, so I am going to grab another character. I get the, uh, the times. So number times, I can't really do anything with that. Right? And so I'm going to go through this, this whole kind of bubbling up step again. Yeah, I go to be a um, a thing times thing, no good. Go to be a uh, a term. Let's see. Can be a. Right. So times factor. Factor terms. Yeah, I actually have to go. Yes, yeah, so I have to go to a term, right? Get backwards because it's this, yeah. the stack flips around the order of stuff. It's confusing. Right, so there's some plus. I'm just trying to see why we wouldn't reduce at this point. But I guess because the the shift takes precedent, is that right? Or because some plus a term. That's one of our rules. Mm -hmm. But term would be term times factor before it would be factor. Term. So term times factor. We probably can't make it a term yet. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm. Term times something beats some of us. So I think it just it has its own idea that the shifting that times you know that a shift is is better than a reduce. I'm a little unclear on that. But. Why don't we just that that would be our working assumption How here. How about reducing? I, I guess we'll get there. We might. <laughs> it's working with more than just the top of the stack. Okay, yeah, because eventually it'll collapse. 
yeah, I mean, this, we'll build up some stuff, but then we'll collapse it back down because we'll, we'll pull off four times five and then shift back on but 20. four times five is three separate levels of that. Yeah, we get to look down. We can't skip over something, but we can start at the top and match one of these rules. Do we? Okay. Is that for another plus instead of time to reduce it? Plus plus plus. Yeah. But I'm not sure. We would only reduce it if there was no possible combination at the top of the stack in the next token. Yeah, because it, it looks at the next token to see is there anything that I can do. Okay, so. It only, I think it only shifts, it only reduces when there's nothing that it can do with the next token. So when that first, that top, the top well, of the stack started out as a number, and we, in terms of precedence, if you had three times four plus five, then it would, the, the times would win over the plus. Yeah, because you would have term times a factor and then a plus. And you can't do anything with the plus until you have a term. So the, the term times factor, you couldn't say factor plus, but you could take the term and the factor and make them into a term, and then you'd have a term and a plus. Yeah. So when the number that was put on, on the top of the stack kept producing and it reduced up the term, was the, the decision when it would reduce to and when it would stop, did that involve looking at the entire stack? Or, 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 a, no. or that was purely the thing that's in the look ahead buffer and the top of the stack, right? Right. It could be the top several things in the stack. What? Okay. Was it? Uh, no. I don't think in any of these rules. Like when we were deciding where that would stop, that number, it, it stopped at term, didn't go to sum. Was it looking down at the fact that the two preceding elements on the stack were sum and plus, or was that decision based just on the term and the? I think that decision is based just on the term and the, and the times. Okay. But you could have. I mean, this this is a little misleading because all of our rules are very short. You know, all of the rules go from all the productions of the form you know, non-terminal to three, you know, two or three things non-terminals or terminals. But you can have much more complex productions. So at this point, it looks like we get to shift the times. And now we get another number from Lex. So now we have Number five over over there. Um, we can't we can't reduce term times, so we can shift number over here. So that time when we were looking at reducing term times, we were looking too deep into the stack. Yeah. So we don't have any rule that says term times number. Did, did we or we don't have any. Further down and say, oh, we also don't have any rules that you think for using sum plus term times. Like, yeah. Do you look at the whole stack for every single time that you shift? That's what I'm not sure I get. I don't know if they have a way of kind of optimizing that away or not. If that's kind of part of the finite state machine, kind of keeps track of what, what the next transition could be. But I mean, certainly, like worst case, you could have to look. You know, at every step, you could have to look as far down the stack as you know your largest production. So we don't have a term times a number, and so we have to do you know, for the third time this bubbling up and saying that a number goes up to a thing and then to a factor.
So finally, we, we actually get to do something. Because you know, term times a factor is a rule that we have. And so there's not even any next token. And so Yak doesn't really have much of a choice at this point. But luckily, it's got the rule that will reduce this. So we say term times a factor. Where uh, we get to say uh, the result of that is the multiplication between the two. And so we pop it off and we replace it with a term with the semantic value of 20. And now we have some plus a term, which is also a rule. And it's only, it's only by that precedent that it would rather shift tokens than reduce that we didn't already do this. Right? Because it's, it's been sitting there, which is, yeah, I think what you're asking about. And now we get to uh, reduce this and get 23. Isn't it also, with its regular expressions in general, it always attempts to match the longest regular expression possible? Yeah. So that this is an extension of that. It's trying to match the longest rule that it can before it tries to process. I'm not sure how closely they're related. I mean, it seems like the same, like kind of similar behavior. But I think it's just um, I think it's more a consequence of how the algorithm works that it has to do that in order to to actually mimic the grammar that you've written. I'm not sure. If Shai were awake, then we could ask him. <laughs> if you left off the five, it would just break and give you an error. Because it doesn't have any rules there. Yeah, if we had left off the 5, then it would have been stuck with that sum plus term times. And seeing that there were no more tokens, and there was no rule to reduce the top of the stack, then it would give you an error. I guess the place where the looking for the longest thing to reduce would <coughs> seem to come in was if you had something like 4 minus 2, and then it was done, and it looked down. And it, yeah, it wouldn't reduce the minus 2 to a negative 2, right? It would look all the way down and do the subtraction operation, right? Yeah, 4 minus 2. Even though it, it could find a valid thing to reduce by only looking too deep in the stack, it would instead keep looking until it stopped finding valid reductions or something. Does that make sense? I don't quite follow. Like if, if your expression was was four minus two, yeah, right. Minus, but you have a rule for negatives in here, right? Down in right things. But he doesn't allow negatives in front of the numbers. numbers. No, you can. Negative yeah. thing and thing. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I haven't tested it, so you know, so, I'm not. So it could choose to reduce that negative two to a negative two, and then we have like two numbers next to each other or something. But instead, it does the whole thing as a subtraction. Yeah, because it would rather. How does that work? I should test it out to see if it even does work. Oh. So it's left as an exercise to the reader to figure out why that works. <laughs> could you could you show us like say if you wrote this lesson yeah files how to actually turn it into the calculator? Yeah, yeah, I was. That's what you're in the middle of. The I was doing that until I uh, figured out that I had introduced. 20 shift reduce conflicts. How many people are familiar with make files? All right, this is oddly similar to the grammar itself, in kind of an uncanny way. That the uh, the first 
first thing up here, all that's kind of like S. And here I'm just trying to say that you know, if I don't make everything, then I have to make calc first. If I want to make calc, then I have to have these files. And here's, this, here's a rule to combine these files into a program called calc. And to get these two files, then I need my yak file. And here's a command to make my yak file turn into these files, and so forth. And these are the, this yak and lex command, that's all you do to the, the files that are on the handout. You, just, you run lex on the lex one, you run yak on the yak one. And it produces some C files, this lex.yy.c and y.tab.c and y.tab.h. I have no idea why they call them those, but that's, that's how it's always been done. And you just compile it all together and it so you run lex on the lex yeah. file, yak on the on the .y file, and then you run make on. Right. I mean, running lex and yak only generates you know some C files and a header file. Yeah. So it's it's up to you to either write a make file or type in these commands. I mean, just like if you know if it generated a Java file, then you have to sit down and say you know type Java C and whatever the .java file was. Does it, does it It's human readable. It's it's I mean, not very human readable, but so it has all, all these tables. These are you know, various kinds of transition tables. It's kind of uh, this is its way of recording what are the valid transitions, um, all the data associated with the finite state machine that it kind of emulates internally. Yeah. So I don't know how long it is. This is what I was saying before that that you know a hacker or a programmer who thinks highly of himself would say, well, I just write this myself from scratch for a particular application. You might be able to write this calculator from scratch and see faster than it would take you to learn to do it through the tools of Lux and Yak. But most people agree that that's probably not true once you're used to the tool. That it, that, it, that this actually generates better code than you would generate. The same way compilers generate better code than you just writing in machine code nowadays. Furthermore, a lot of a lot of what you might do, maybe a third of what you might do in Yak is to make better error messages. Mm -hmm. That would be hard to do. There's this YY error that will accept just a string, but you can also say on the fifth character of this line and then print out the line. We were expecting the right parentheses you gave us. Mm -hmm. You can vary for folks. You can cut it down for whatever your user wants. And, um, that would be hard if you were writing it by hand. It would be hard for you to religiously remember all the error messages. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, you can, in general, you can write a parser that's faster than Yak. You know, if you really put your mind to it and you're willing to throw away six months. But it's rarely worth it, you know, because not only do you get, you know, nice error messages, but you also have this formal description, you know, as the input for Yak of what your language is and what is and is not valid syntax. And so in six months if you decide, you know, that, that decision about the syntax of my little toy language that I made that was I mean, stupid, you know, people are, you know, using this thing in, in just kind of brain dead ways. I want to change the syntax of my language. Then you can change it at the level of its definition. You can say, you know, I no longer count that as a syntactic form that's legal in my language and you comment out one line. Whereas if you, you know, hack up you know, 500 lines of C code that you know, magically parses your language, then there's a real mix between what's defining the language and what's just this machinery to parse it. And for the scanning side, you just don't try it because you won't beat Lex. It's, it's really not that much there's not a lot of complexity to scanning for strings. And you've got you know, 20 years of Unix hackers behind you in terms of optimizing for you know, scanning very quickly. But the advantage is what computer science is all about, which is cutting the level of abstraction higher and, and letting you focus on what you really want to say instead of worrying about the details. 
So like you said, you want to change your grammar, you change your grammar, and then everything's done, and you don't have to worry about the stuff underneath. Mm -hmm. What kind of problems do you use this for? Um, so I do this for a living, right? I've, I've written three languages, and for, for, for them I, I use Yak. And when I didn't, when my boss wrote his own finite state machine, it was just very hard to maintain. He was very smart. He used to do assembly language programming, and Yak wasn't available. I'm not sure those are correlated. But it was just hard <laughs> to maintain. You had to take it on faith, and then ten years later we realized, yes, under this very strange circumstance, you could end up with, uh, if you wrote it by hand under a very strange circumstance, uh, you could end up with, with, a, with an error, a minor error, in fact, but very hard to understand. First, if you had done it in Yak, the 20 rules would be right in front of you. It would be very hard to screw up in such a way that, that it's self. It, yeah. It would break right in, right in front of you. It would break on inspection. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stuff were you doing? I mean, what was the We did three you? things. One was um, a, 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 like a language of algebra to solve differential equations. So the consultant would write at unordered, thousands of unordered algebraic equations, and we would have to check them. Are they tactically correct? And then turn them into machine language, and then reorder them, turn them into machine language, and so forth. So that was outside the purview of Yak. But Yak would say, is every incoming expression well formed? And if not, is it because they left off a factor of five, or was it a minus, minus, or where were they in order to give them better error messages? And another one was a report generation language, so that someone could say, I'd like to plot these curves, do arithmetic on these curves, and do for loops and if then. So there's a simple little programming language. So I'm a big believer in little languages. It, it, it might not be the wave of the future, but it was the wave of the past. Neil, are you asking when do you use parsing in programs? Is that, or are you asking yeah. what parsing is? Could it be any program you want to write that's going to have complicated kinds of input streams would and could benefit from something like this. Although this day and age, it also would be much more tempting just to go to XML, mm -hmm. write a DTP, yeah. which explains it the same way, and just sort of the modern version of that, kind of, of the, of the, of the Lex side. Right, I and mean, what you're doing in XML is basically, it's like when, um, scheme guy, what's his name? Jerry Sussman. Right, when he says, you know, use scheme that it requires no parsing, right? That's what you're doing when you use XML. XML is like a very verbose S expression. So there are things that are much harder or you have to be much more explicit to express them if you want to go to XML. Because there, there are times when you would like to be more expressive than kind of well-formed XML, or that you would like to say something like 2 plus 4 times 5, but you don't want to kind of explicitly encode, you know, start term to end term binary operation plus all this. You, you end up having to kind of add the explicit levels of precedence that you do when you write, you know, paren plus, paren to or paren star two five whatever. So, um, so, not coincidentally, what, what what Rusty did today is actually exactly what we're going to see on Monday in continuing with this more theoretical approach, which is how to take some grammar and turn it into a machine calculation. So somebody gives you the grammar, but how do you make a machine to go ahead and look at the strings? and accept what that grammar generates. So that's what Yak is doing. It's, it's, it's creating this program that goes ahead and does the machine calculation that checks whether a given string could have come from that grammar. Now, it's very complicated, and it's a big, big topic, because Yak is expecting an LR1 grammar, right? Almost. Almost. So if you give Yak a general context-free grammar, you're going to get the kind of stuff Rusty got when he got those errors. It can't take a regular context-free grammar, because then it comes up with this non-deterministic machine, and it doesn't know what to do. What we're going to do in class is I'm going to show you how to take any grammar and how to make the non-deterministic machine. That's interesting, because it shows this equivalence. But if you want to do something really practical, you talk about special kinds of context-free grammars that, when you convert them to machines, end up being deterministic machines. And what kinds of grammars are they? There are these LR 
one or LRK grammars, and how do you actually take those grammars, and how do you know that you have one, and when you have it, how do you take it and make it into a machine? And there's a lot of theory about that. So maybe, maybe Dimitri may do that one day this month. Maybe, right, Dimitri? Maybe. 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 <laughs> there's a lot to it, and it's dry, but it's very practical. If you want to know how a compiler works, and in some sense how this YAC is working, you need to know what an LR1 grammar is. You need to know how to take it and parse it. You know, and, and there's different kinds of parsing. This is just one way, right? This is bottom up, one symbol look ahead. Yeah. And there's other ways to do parsing too, and other kinds of grammars that are associated with that. And it's a whole area. All right.